gin, smokable stimulants, and sleep deprivation. The perfect ingredients in a recipe for disaster. Especially when the pot they're brewing in is a mentally ill squatter that likes to wave around big sticks when he's mad. The man described is Daryl, my dad's old high school buddy, the 40-something-year-old antagonist of one of my life's more traumatic events, which took place back in 2015. It was a warm, fragrant springtime afternoon, and I was an 18-year-old kid coming home from a day of class at the local community college. Coming home to my dad's anarchist trap house that my friend and I decided to move into, as roommates, a year before. It was a small, one-story, downtown house in an upscale neighborhood, and it had five to seven vagabond guests or couch surfers at any given time. That's up to ten people under one roof, or two, if you count the shed. Conflict was inevitable. I entered and through the side gate, from the well-manicured, street-facing front into the neglected, junk-filled back. There he was, sitting at his crooked, worn-out metal table placed right in my path to the bent-up screen door. Daryl was dressed in his finest filthy, brown hobo jacket, as he carved his latest piece of stick art. He looked up at me with glazed eyes and an absent expression. This struck me as odd, since, although he was weird, he wasn't usually this weird. When I looked closer at his table, I saw why. Along with his usual random pieces of metal and rocks he used for his wants, there was a blackened glass tube, a lighter, and a four-fifths empty gallon jug of rock at gin. The gin I had watched him bring home with him the night before. The night before, he had been partying, having fun, and acting fairly normal. But the presence of the charred, straight-shot glass pipe on the table explained how he had stayed awake this whole time. The contents of this pipe, which were soaked into a screen made from the strands of a copper wire scrubber, can probably be deduced logically. Hint, it rhymes with smack Spokane. I gave Daryl a modest greeting to which he responded with an awkward head movement and unfriendly grunt, as he continued to aggressively carve a stick. His body language gave me a dark vibe, full of animosity. What I experienced while walking in was unusual, but nothing too crazy to me. I had seen worse in that house, and had such a chip on my shoulder, I was almost itching for some kind of altercation to take my anger out on, on a daily basis. If this was my opportunity to protect my territory, I would do it with pleasure. I was a massive stoner and a bit of an alcoholic at the time, and upon arriving home, I usually would have stopped by my friend's room to say hi and smoke a bowl or two, but he was at his mom's house that night. Which meant that, unfortunately, he was not able to witness the events that would be taking place over the following couple of hours. Although I had substance issues, I was still an honor roll student. So, instead of smoking a bowl, I just went straight back to my room to get some economics homework done. I had worked for about 45 minutes before focusing became impossible due to loud noises and yelling coming from the kitchen, which was just beyond the hallway entrance, mere feet from my bedroom door. This was simply not something I would tolerate, so I grabbed my 2009 digital camera, I didn't have a smartphone, and made my way to the heart of the commotion. Holding my camera, I entered the kitchen to find my dad and his two tough biker friends huddled together near the sink. Daryl had, more or less, a cornered theme. His arms were outstretched, making his hobo jacket appear like brown wings as he held up his largest stick in one hand, like Rafiki's staff in The Lion King. When I had walked in, I said nothing to alert him to my presence. I simply held up the camera to record him as he verbally spilled his darkest demons on all of us. He was belligerently screaming at my dad and his friends, but his biggest target was Joe, a lovable old biker dude who has been my dad's friend my whole life, and who never treated Daryl with anything but friendliness and respect. Daryl was screaming about how he was a racist, while Joe continued to deny it, raising his voice to match. While I can't speak for Joe's personal beliefs, I will emphasize that Daryl did not face any sort of discrimination under our roof. He may have felt disrespected at times, but his behavior was often unacceptable, and any confrontation was well deserved. During one of his loud, drunken, barely coherent rants, Daryl had begun hitting all the wooden cabinets with his stick, pairing his screaming with the crazed rhythms of a wild man. I continued to hold the camera out towards him, making no attempt to hide it or leave the room, all while he creeped his way towards me, whacking each cabinet along the way. You may see me as naive and crazy to do this, but I was filled with excitement. My desire to record him was mainly for evidence, but it was also partly inspired by my love for the YouTuber, McJuggernuggets, aka Psycho Kid. He turned his head to face mine at an unnatural speed. His face scrunched into a scowl as he laid eyes on me and my camera. With his rock at gin breath, he got up in my face, waving his stick around in his hand, as if to threaten me. 
Get that camera out of my freaking fact, boy, he slurred. I cursed back at him in defiance and held firm as he tried to grab it from me. We wrestled back and forth from my green digital camera for about 10 seconds as it continued to record. Fortunately I was able to get it back, and as I did, he moved to get close and intimidate me again, more aggressively now. Even though he was 10 inches taller than me, 18 year old me had a tendency to be numb to situations like this, and my fear response had lessened with time. Having spent the previous 3.5 years self-harming and on the edge of unaliving myself, I had already embraced death. This wasn't the only time I put myself in dangerous situations that year, almost hoping for violence. I was also incredibly territorial and protective of my family and people I cared for, and, being extremely insecure, I was very sensitive to any perceived disrespect to myself or the house. As he towered over me, my right hand rested around the closed lid of an empty cookie jar sitting on the kitchen table. At that moment I knew, if he got out of hand, that jar would be my last resort. I loosened my grip on the jar, pushed Daryl away, and watched him move back from me and make his way back to torment my dad and his friends again. I took this opportunity to put my camera back in my room, and came out a minute later to find that my dad and the biker dudes had gone to my dad's back room. Daryl had gone back to his dirty mattress in the dark shadows of the living room in the front of the house. Things had lulled, and I still had homework to do so I went back to my room. After about a half hour, darkness had fallen outside, and things were too quiet. Something had to be wrong. I wanted to check on my dad and his friends, so I left my room and found myself alone in an eerie, grimy kitchen with the lights on and dark windows facing the night. There was a soft mumbling to my left. Daryl was kneeling in the dim rays of light, cast from the kitchen to the contrasting darkness of the living room. He was holding two billiard balls he had taken from the pool table one in each upward-facing hand, in outstretched arms. His head, rolled back to face the ceiling, in a perfect position to channel demons like an antenna. Like his head, his eyes were rolled back, with only the bloodshot whites being visible. As his head gently jerked around with this satanic mumbling, the dim light reflected off his bald scalp, shaven smooth with a big razor. His unkempt salt and pepper goatee was specked with foamy dribble. Seconds after I saw him, he jolted into life like an animated corpse. His face contorted into a hatred I haven't seen before or since, as he launched toward me from his kneeled position, still holding the pool balls in each hand. Thinking quickly, I grabbed the cookie jar and, with Daryl close on my tail, retreated to my dad's room. Fortunately, the lights were on here as well, and the room had a door connecting to the backyard. He caught up to me there, so I pushed him back into a wooden table in the corner, which broke under his weight. He quickly recovered, and sneered back at me as he bolted up from the wreckage. As he did so, I stumbled out the back door, tripped backward down the two concrete steps, and landed on the cement patio bordering the grass. Time had condensed in that moment, as all of this occurred in just a few seconds. When I landed, the cookie jar in my right hand had broken and I was bleeding heavily from a large gash on my palm, caused by the broken porcelain. But there was no pain. I wound up my pitching arm from my position on the ground and, as he was about to make his way through the back door, I launched the jagged remnants of the cookie jar which still weighed at least a pound or two, through the air. Lucky strike. The cookie jar crashed through the glass window in the back door and hit Daryl squarely on the forehead. He went limp and collapsed onto the floor of my dad's room. He didn't get up. It was his turn to bleed. Having faced this entire situation alone, I made my way to the shed to find my dad, his 60-year-old biker friend, Joe, and Joe's other biker friend. I opened the shed door and there they were, all sitting in a close circle, whispering to each other. Tough men, cowering in this tiny one-room living space in the corner of the yard. These three grown men left 18-year-old me alone to fend for myself in a house with a violent psychopath. But I forgave them. They genuinely seemed terrified, and I was thanked profusely by all of them for solving their problem. I appreciated the ego boost, but we still had two problems. I was bleeding heavily, and Daryl was unconscious and bleeding twice as much as I was. I was advised to wrap my wounds, get in my car and drive the 25 minutes to my grandma's house in the woods. I bled in my car all the way to grandma's house. When I was there, I soaked my wounds in soapy water, hoping to avoid getting stitches, since I still didn't know if I was considered a criminal or not, and wanted to lie low. About 20 minutes into soaking, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. I had a feeling it was related to the event that had just taken place, and I was correct. It was a deputy from the sheriff's department, at the scene of the crime. I was quaking, but explained to her exactly what happened in complete honesty. 
Her response filled me with lightness like a helium balloon. It was self-defense, she had said. Daryl was obviously blacked out and having a psychotic episode. According to the police, Daryl was found lying in a pool of blood on the front porch. A neighbor had called the police and, when they arrived, Daryl had woken up and begun to attack them, screaming about racism. Apparently, he believed the police were racist, and there to harass him. He believed he was becoming a victim of racist police brutality, and decided to attack the police before they attacked him. He attacked a female police officer too. Not cool. After learning that, I got back in the car to drive myself to the emergency room, and continued to make a bloody mess of it for the whole 25-minute drive there. That night, I stayed over at my grandma's house. When I went back to my dad's house the next day, I learned a few details from my dad about what happened after I left. Daryl had bled so much that my dad and his friends were unable to absorb it faster than it was coming out, even after using all the towels in the house. It was at that point that they dragged him onto the front porch. They wanted to be done with him, and let society deal with it. Daryl got treated at the hospital himself that night, and spent the next two weeks in jail for disorderly conduct. I'm happy to say that he never came back to our house and I never saw him again. In a sense, my dad and his friends were right. I did solve a problem. The guy was a squatter and a menace, and now he was gone. Best part? He was so messed up on drugs, he could hardly remember what happened. He thought it was Joe the biker who hit him. He has no memory of fighting with me. Now, seven years later, this event still stands out to me in the story of my life. I learned a lot from spending a year living in an anarchist trap house, but the biggest thing I learned is to stand up for yourself and your territory, even when it makes people not like you and to always watch out for tweakers when they drink cheap gin. I'm going to give some background before I start this very long story. I'm very close to my cousins, Cooper, Tim, Eric, and Emily. I go to their house to hang out frequently. I was at my cousin's church, I was helping with the vacation Bible school at the time. I played Abednego, Cooper played Shadrach, and Tim played Meshach, three prominent biblical figures. While helping with VBS, I met an acquaintance of my cousins, Matthew Wilson. Matthew was a socially awkward guy that had just recently moved to their church. He seemed like a nice guy but lacked humor, social skills, and confidence. Matthew was obsessed with Michael Jackson. He would constantly try to mimic Michael Jackson's dance moves, while they were impressively on point, it still made everyone shudder with cringe. He would try so hard to be funny and cool but he would fail miserably every time. He was one of the most cringeworthy people I know in person. After spending time around Matthew, I found that something was a bit off with him. One day I told Emily that I thought Matthew was kinda weird and she responded with, you know what's wrong with him right? Then she told me that he told her that he was physically abused and his parents hated him. I had heard his story from Eric, Emily, and Eric told two very different stories. The story that Eric told me was that Matthew's parents formerly had a mild drinking problem but were fine now. The story that Emily told me was that they were critically addicted to alcohol and were extremely abusive to Matthew. I didn't believe the story he told Emily, because Matthew is a notorious liar who exaggerates almost everything he says and his parents were some of the most affectionate people. The next thing that Emily told me was the most shocking, Matthew was supposedly possessed by a demon. She told me that he has episodes in which he starts to convulse and his eyes turn pitch black. I didn't believe that. I told her that sounds like a serious medical condition but she was adamant that it was a demon. She said that he would develop a sickening smile every time it happened and that she had witnessed it happen several times. Matthew lied all the time, I thought he probably faked it and she was just imagining the black eye part or he had something severely wrong with him. Nothing really creepy popped up for a little while until about three weeks ago. Several people were staying over at my cousin's house, me, Matthew, Nathan, Matthew's slow-witted brother who takes everything literally and Cameron, a good friend of Tim. Matthew was quite social actually, he was playing Smash Brothers and cracking jokes. However, all of a sudden he stopped talking and playing the game, he abruptly stopped playing in the middle of the match and walked off blankly, he wasn't going to the bathroom or to go get something either. He would just wander off no matter what he was doing beforehand, it was totally random. He didn't explain why he quit in the middle of the game and didn't respond to any of our questions. He would have random spells of being blank and creepy. One minute he would be social and then the next he would go emotionless and unresponsive. Later, I woke up at like 5 in the morning and saw Matthew sitting up and staring blankly at the wall, everyone else was asleep. He didn't have his headphones nor his phone, he was just staring at the wall creepily. The next day he was as social as can be and didn't have any unresponsive spells to my knowledge at the time, 
however $50 of Eric's money disappeared. The blame shifted on Cameron, but I believe Matthew took the money. He was awake when everyone was asleep and is a known chronic liar. Emily later told me that Matthew came into her room very early, around 6.30, only about 30 minutes after she woke up. She told me that he came in there seeking refuge from the crowded, hot, and smelly room. Me, Tim, Eric, and Cameron were all still sleeping in the room right next to hers. We had stayed up super late. Matthew plopped himself down in Emily's swing without his phone or anything to entertain himself and stared at Emily from the corner of his eye. Emily, a little creeped out, went to go let her two dogs in and wipe the mud off their feet. When she was going back up the stairs to return to her room, she saw a tip of a shoe at the top of the stairway, mostly hidden by the dark corner. When she got to the top, she saw Matthew, sitting in the dark hall, slowly banging his head on the wall. As soon as she walked into her room, he followed her in the room saying in a faint and motionless whisper, I'm not trying to scare you or anything. She then lied to him to get him to leave, saying she is about to change. About one week ago, Lena, Emily's best friend revealed something very dark about Matthew. Matthew texted her quite a bit, bestowing his darkest secrets to her. He had fallen in love with her, which he freely told her, she was only 12 and he was 15. He told her that he hears voices and every time he talks bad about himself it isn't him, it was the demon. He told Lena that the demon specifically doesn't like her because she is nice to Matthew. I told Lena to tell him to stop and to block him. She refused to because she felt bad for him. That very night Lena sent me some screenshots of messages that Matthew had sent her minutes prior. He texted her as the demon and acted like he was possessed. I had enough at this point. I told him off through a text. Cooper called my aunt who then told Matthew's parents. The next day at church Matthew and Nathan showed up at a much later day than usual when he saw Lena. He went up and gave her a very uncomfortable and strange hug in which he leaned his head against hers and apologized. He exclaimed that it wasn't his fault, he couldn't control it. After the sermon, I was talking to Tyler, a good friend, and out of the corner of my eye I saw Matthew staring dead at me. I turned around to see Matthew, standing in the darker corner of the church, giving me a cold unflinching stare. Today, actually only just a few minutes ago while writing this, he texted me, Tim, and Eric. He said and I quote, I'm going to take some time away for a while. I don't know how long, but it will be several weeks. If you see me at church, don't talk to me. Don't ask why, just know it's for the better. I have theorized to my cousins that he might have a multi-personality disorder. Some cases of this have people switching eye color when switching personalities which explains the color changes during his episodes. While not black, several other kids who have also witnessed Matthew's episodes said that his eyes do change when he enters these fits. The popular opinion is that they changed to a very dark brown, while Matthew normally has very light blue eyes. Also, multiple different personalities can form when someone has had a very traumatic event. I believe whatever happened in Matthew's past created the demon. He didn't get enough attention as a kid, so he subconsciously created the demon to get attention. Or he could have schizophrenia. Matthew stated that he hears voices sometimes. Or the most possible answer, this is a sick way to get attention and have been pretending this whole time. So if you're reading this, Matthew, I want you to know you are a pathetic human being that uses superstitions to mask your own problems and insecurities. Even though it's inevitable that I will see you again, I want you to leave and take your damn demon with you. This is a long story, as it's been over five years in the making. I've actually posted this story before, but there are some really good internet sleuths here on Reddit, and they were able to figure out ex-beauty queen's identity and mine, too. I don't really care if I give up my identity but didn't want it to be on my actual account, so I deleted it a while back. The catalyst for me to repost it today on a throwaway is that it's cathartic. Last week, yet another court date for ex-beauty queen stalker came and went. We've been expecting things to proceed with her entering a plea of guilty or not guilty but no such luck, all we got was another vague reason as to why she's not ready and a new court date issued, months from now. There have been many court dates since she has been arrested. It's been over 18 months since she's been arrested for her continued stalking and harassment, and she still wants to drag things on, to seemingly try and stay relevant in our lives. As an aside, the amount of court resources and taxpayers' money that's wasted is actually really astounding. Anyway, onto the story. To recap, my husband dated a beauty queen title holder of a well-known pageant before me. They broke up long before we met. She was a statuesque blonde, very tall, a knockout in her day in my opinion. This is somewhat important to the story, I guess. But, 
while she was a dazzling pageant winner on the outside, on the inside, oh boy. She could be charming and beautiful if she needed you, but mostly, she treated people around her terribly, including my husband, and he eventually broke it off with her. But she never went away. She would continue to call and email, repeatedly, even after my husband and I met. If anything, her calls increased. She would call over and over again, day and night, even after my husband, then boyfriend, blocked her number. She would ask for money, and threatened to go to the police claiming he abused her if he didn't give it to her. He obviously did not give her money. This made her very upset. The threats increased and became more malicious. But when that didn't work, she would switch tactics and try and sweetly ask him for help with certain projects she was trying to get off the ground, or more accurately, have him do the work for her and she take the credit, with the promise that, if he did just this one last thing for her, she would go away. He did not reply. So she would go back to being malicious. Any tactic for attention, or for what she really wanted, money. My husband was terrified. Because of course, while he never did anything to her, it would be her word over his and he was terrified of ruining his reputation and career. We unfortunately ended up at an event she also attended. She had been waiting for us to arrive and had placed herself near the entrance of the event. As we walked in, she stood across the room, looking me up and down, laughing and whispering into the ear of her date, making a point to try and make me uncomfortable. But that was okay, she was easily ignored until she ambushed me as I came out of the bathroom. She had clearly been waiting for a moment when I was alone. She towered over me, she is very tall, I had no intention of having it out with her and as I hurriedly walked to find my husband, but she kept pace beside me, hunched over, so she was at my eye level, I'm 5 feet 5 inches, her head turned towards me. She was like a caricature of herself as she ambled beside me, smiling maniacally. Where is your man? She hissed in her heavy accent. Her eyes were black. She looked like out of a Tim Burton movie hunched over with that crazy demonic smile. Watch your back, Pug, she added, grinning. She liked to call me names like Pug because I own Pugs and I guess she thought this was an insult. What I didn't know then was while I was in the bathroom, she had walked over to my husband and had thrown her arm around him while he was in mid-conversation with someone, and introduced herself to the man he was talking to, as if she and my husband were together. My husband unwrapped himself from her clutches and told her to beat it. She then beelined and waited for me to come out of the washroom. We stopped going to the parties. The last time we ran into her was at a funeral for a mutual friend. She followed me around at the wake. As my husband, boyfriend at the time, was talking to the man's widow, I was talking to a friend and his wife. She walked right up and stood with us, joining us mid-conversation as if she were part of the group. It was unnerving but also just, bizarre. It was a funeral and I did not want a scene. I silently picked my wine glass off the bar and walked away, leaving her with the couple I had been speaking to and her staring at me with a smirk on her face. All in all, annoying but manageable. However, the emails, calls never stopped. She would call my husband over and over, day and night, even though he had long blocked her number. She would drive by. I found my car keyed one night after I left it outside, but obviously I couldn't prove it's her. But enough was enough. My husband had a lawyer send a cease and desist. After the first, she called him from a private number. He answered and she said, i.e., it's me, in a sing-song voice like they were the best of friends and he hadn't just sent her a lawyer's letter ordering her to stay away from him and his family. He said nothing and hung up. Another cease and desist was sent. Then a third. Nothing would make her go away. She did not actually think my husband was capable of not wanting to be with her, because you know, her beauty. Eventually though, she got pissed that he was not giving in. So, she decided to take this rage to the internet. I knew that she was absolutely checking out my social media but I don't really use it much so I didn't care. However, she created a fake Twitter account and tweeted, husband's name is a fraud and tagged his colleagues, friends, investors, and family members. Every single person she could think of to try and ruin his reputation and career. On New Year's Eve, she posted on my Instagram account at exactly 12.01am. Happy New Year's scrut, social media settings were all put to private. We went to the police armed with the emails threatening to give her money or she would go to the police. She was charged with two counts of harassment, and a restraining order was put into place. To our shock, the next day after her arrest, our phones were buzzing. This story had made front page news, clearly a slow news day. Her day in court came, right before COVID. We arrived at the courthouse and sat down. She walked in, we were shocked by her appearance. Actually shocked is an understatement. She was unrecognizable from her former self. Gone was the statuesque, dazzling blonde. 
She had apparently shaved her head and was wearing a short, ratty brown wig. She had gained about 80 pounds, give or take, and was now sort of hunched. With her height and new girth, she looked like a linebacker. To add to her new look, she wore a bulky brown men's overcoat and a scarf tied over her wig, like a babushka. My immediate thought was, her outside now matches her inside. But it was her eyes that I noticed the most. About a year earlier, we had shown a photo of her to our kids so that if she ever approached them, they knew to run. At the time, my son, who was young, commented that she had mean eyes. From the mouth of babes. Maybe it was that she had changed so much physically overall, but her dark eyes had narrowed into deep, black slits. As she scanned the courtroom and saw us in court, she would turn around every so often to look back at us and glare. She would then whisper in her lawyer's ear, and laugh as if she were having a grand time. She had a pair of big, round cheap sunglasses that she would put on and take off intermittently. When she addressed the judge, she put them on, and he asked her to remove them. We thought she was putting on a brave face and treating it all like a joke, but we were about to find out that getting arrested wouldn't slow her down. The restraining order didn't seem to faze her at all. If anything, it angered her more. From then on, every day, night and day, she would post from multiple fake social media accounts, posting photos of myself, of my husband. She would put up my husband's photo with the caption, pedophile, or other terrible names that included racist and transphobic comments and captions. To give you a slight idea, she posted altered pictures of my husband, photoshopped to look like he was wearing heavy makeup and referring to him as a pre-op transgender. She posted altered and unflattering photos of myself. She called me old, ugly, those are the G-rated ones. Listen, I'm no beauty queen myself. The name calling, while obsessive and gross, wasn't what bothered me most. Although I'm not going to lie, seeing hundreds of photos of myself on her fake Twitter account calling me ugly and obsessively pointing out every single perceived flaw did succeed in getting me down at times. Why did I keep looking? Because it was like getting a glimpse into her unraveling slash unraveled mind, just in case it was a clue of what she was capable of or thinking of doing next. Because it wasn't her insulting posts that fazed me. What bothered me most were the sinister captions keep an eye on your kids because I be watching, or, why don't you plant some flowers in your front yard, or, be good to your kids because you never know what could happen, I was your Uber Eats order. She would post pictures of me with an arrow directed to my head, which I perceived to be a gun to my heart. She posted pictures of my husband's workplace, which she was not allowed to be within two blocks of, in accordance to the restraining order, but the police said this could be just a picture she took from the internet side she posted Agatha Christie quotes like every killer is usually someone you know well or your end is near her Twitter profile banner picture was taken from a movie poster and said stalker like she was in on the joke we called the police again but they said there wasn't anything they could do since she didn't explicitly tag us I took screenshots of everything many of her posts were nonsensical but most were photos posted of us on this fake account all altered with derogatory or ominous captions but we couldn't get her shut down. I became anxious any time my kids were outside shooting hoops in the driveway. My elderly mother wouldn't take the baby out in the stroller. She was too scared. It affected all of our lives. Life became dramatic. The ex-beauty queen would taunt us with, catch me if you can. She posted close UPS of her dog's genitals, or a piece of her dog's shit with my name beside it, the implication obvious. It bothered me that she now had a dog, since I didn't think someone like her was capable of caring for anything living. Then the calls started back up, this time to our home line, yes we still have a home phone, lol. Bitch, and then a hang up. Karma will get you, and then weird chants like calls, as if she were reciting a spell. Sure enough, she posted photos of a pentagram and candles, as some sort of altar in the caption, ring ring. Finally, finally, the police asked us to come in and give video statements. We gave them a drive containing thousands of screenshots of posts she had made. They arrested her again and charged her with two more counts of criminal harassment. My husband was angry at this point, but as Mama Bear, I just wanted to get this over with. She mentioned the kids frequently and ominously many times in her online rants, also calling them rude names, which I won't repeat here because these are the things that upset me most. The judge also issued a social media ban for her. By the time she was rearrested for the second time, her fake Twitter account, which was literally mostly insults or references to my family, had 16,000 tweets in a three-month period. She has no followers so they were just to herself. The porn sites I had been continuously being tagged on stopped. Things quieted down tremendously, but I still get follower requests that I believe are her. But at this point, we were all on edge. I kid you not, I felt weird walking into my kitchen at night to make a sandwich, 
feeling creeped out that she was outside watching. I put nothing past her, as nothing is more dangerous than a desperate woman who has nothing to lose. Which, by the way, was one of the quotes she posted. I don't know what is wrong with her. I believe, from what I've researched, she is a malignant narcissist. Perhaps some other mental issues are at play here, but I can say she was a terrible person long before she decided to try and make our lives miserable. Crazy beauty queen turned stalker. I would love nothing more than to never meet again. But if going to court helps you stay away from us forever, then bring it. As an aside, I wanted to mention that we heard from a reliable source that after my husband broke up with her, she allegedly became known to police for other reasons. While my husband dodged a bullet regarding her threats to go to police saying he abused her, apparently other men have not been so lucky. Since I can't post pictures, I'll leave you with one of her posts, one that may not make much sense but to us, it was a statement to let us know she enjoys this drawn out court process. Many of her posts are in her native language, so this is translated. Violent women, and the cruelest, never answer questions. They like to continue the misunderstanding indefinitely. So I seek to contact people only in order to torment them. My cruelty is my last attachment to the world, and my last sheik.